Our next speaker, I could easily say, is probably the most recognizable face in the state of Nebraska. The reason I don't say the most recognizable name is because he shares that honor, I think, with uh, Warren Buffett. But otherwise, uh, I don't know of anyone who's more revered and recognized than Coach Osborne. He clearly represents everything that's the best in our state of Nebraska. And before I ask Dr. Gangahar to come up and give an introduction, I just have to relate an interesting anecdote. Uh, it, I was sort of my first year in Nebraska, and I was seeing a patient from Western Nebraska. Um, and Coach Osborne was, uh, was uh, in an electoral uh, contest. And I asked him, do you think uh, who's going to win? Is it, is it going to be Coach Osborne? And he said, you're kind of new here, aren't you, doctor? And I said, I said, yeah, that's true. He said, you know, there's only one person who can beat Coach Osborne. I said, really? And he said, yeah, and that is Jesus himself. <laughs> and he said, if Jesus was Jesus, he wouldn't run against Coach Osborne. So it was my um, quick learning about Coach Osborne. Uh, I'm going to invite Dr. Deepa Gangahar to introduce Coach Osborne, uh, and I'm going to invite Father Hendrickson to honor Coach Osborne on behalf of the summit. Father, uh, Coach Osborne, and Dr. Gangahar. Well, you'll remember earlier I said on a fall football Saturday, third biggest city in the state of Nebraska after Omaha and Lincoln is Memorial Stadium. And I'll tell you the true story. We moved to Nebraska in 1978, July 1st, 1978. And the first game I went to was that year in that fall. That was my first entry into collegiate football. And uh, it was me and my wife, Karen, we're sitting there. And in those days, touchdown used to occur every five or seven minutes. It was a very a, a common occurrence. And the first touchdown occurred, the whole sky was lit red with the red balloons. And of course, all the seats were filled with red-clad uh, Husker fans. So, and, and she made a, made a comment that still uh, I remember. She said, wow, this reminds her her stay in uh, Red Square on a May Day in Moscow. It was so red. So uh, I think it'll be presumptuous of me to introduce uh, a figure like Tom Osborne. But to briefly, uh, Dr. Osborne uh, coached the University of Nebraska football team uh, till 1998 or so. And then he uh, uh, retired from coaching and chose to enter into national politics. He was a congressman uh, for three years from Nebraska. And after finishing his tenure as a congressman, uh, he was uh, invited again to bring some sanity to the, at that time, chaos was occurring in the athletic department at Houston, Nebraska as a AD, athletic director. And he did a yeoman job to re resurrect the program. And uh, finally, after his term, I think 2012 or 13, he retired and went full time into his charity charity that he and his wife, Nancy Osborne, founded 25 years ago, the Teammates. Teammates is a program that began from a middle school in Lincoln with 20 students, and today has over 8,500 kids being mentored through Teammates. Coach Osborne may be the winningest coach in American college football history, but he's respected more for the decency and the wisdom and the humility that he carries. So allow me to introduce Coach Osborne by giving a big hand of applause. Hey, 
As you can see, I'm probably the oldest speaker at this conference. And um, this was driven home to me not long ago. I was, um, I was asked to um, visit somebody in a nursing home. It was a very large nursing home. And uh, I was wandering around trying to find the room. And, uh, and wasn't having much luck. And finally I saw this nice little lady coming down the hallway. I said, excuse me, ma'am, I'm, I'm looking for this room and I can't find it. She said, oh, you poor dear. She said, you just go to the front desk and they'll tell you who you are. So when those kind of things start happening to you, you know that you're getting old. And um, so uh, many times things really aren't as they seem. And uh, and heard a story not long ago that I think pretty well illustrates this. Um, I had a friend here in Omaha who had been out of work for several months and um, was looking everywhere. And one day he um, drove by the zoo and he noticed a sign that said, help wanted. So he went inside and inquired about the job, was interviewed by the um, director of the zoo. And the director said, well, we're kind of embarrassed, but our gorilla died. And we've looked everywhere, all around the world, and we can't find a real gorilla. And you can't be a first class zoo without a gorilla but we do have a gorilla suit. That's the job. Somebody's gonna to have to dress up in a suit and pretend to be a real gorilla. So um, the guy wasn't wild about it, but he thought, well, I'll take a crack at it and really need the work. So he took, it, took the suit home, practiced a little bit, came to work every day, and nobody seemed to have any idea it wasn't a real gorilla. And, uh, but then after a while, he got kind of bored and uh, went in to see the director of the zoo and he said, um, you know, how would it be we build a big trapeze, and uh, I can swing back and forth over all the other animals' cages and kind of spice up my act. Well, the director said that really sounded like a good idea. So he built this huge trapeze, and he was swinging back and forth and, and drawing some big crowds, and everything was going great. Then one day, the swing broke. He fell right on his head in the lion's cage. It was not cold. It was unconscious for a little bit. And when he woke up, the lion was standing over him on all fours looking down at him. And of course, he forgot all about being a gorilla, began to holler for help, and he said, help, help, somebody save me. And the lion looked down at him and he said, shut up, stupid, or you're gonna ruin this for everybody. <laughs> so <clears throat> the, reason I, um, the reason I mentioned that um, sometimes things aren't as they seem. Um, here in the United States, um, on the surface, uh, the plight of young people look fairly favorable, fairly affluent society. Everyone has access to education, some kind of health care. Uh, very few people um, starve to death in the United States, including children. And uh, most everybody has a little bit of discretionary wealth. Most kids have a cell phone, right kind of tennis shoes, whatever is in style. And so you'd say, well, things are going pretty well. But over 36 years of coaching, I noticed some changes. Started coaching back in 1962. And when we went out to recruit young people in the early 60s, it was very seldom that we ran across a young person who wasn't growing up under the same roof with both biological parents. And so a lot of stability in the family. As time went on, that began to change. I began to see more and more young people that I was coaching, some of whom did not have fathers. Some didn't have either a father or a mother. And uh, those kids, for the most part, a little harder to coach. Didn't know as much about discipline. Uh, didn't know quite as well uh, how to relate to authority. And so I began to see more and more of that. And today, 53% of the young people in the United States are growing up without both biological parents. That's over half. 26 million fatherless kids in our country. And so um, that was a concern. Late 60s, early 70s, we began to see the advent of the drug culture. I was in, never heard of methamphetamine, never heard of cocaine back in the early 60s. And now that was hitting us right between the eyes. In the middle 80s, we began drug testing with our football team, and that was pretty much nationwide with NCAA sports. And that would have been unheard of 15 years earlier. 
And then as you know, technology has changed and today the average young person spends seven and a half hours a day in front of a screen of some kind. So it could be a, a cell phone, could be a computer, could be an iPad. And as a result, uh, communication for the most part among most young people is electronic. And so something called an emotional intelligence has certainly faded because when you're dealing with electronic communication, you don't witness body language, you don't feel empathy, you don't understand where somebody's coming from. And so dialogue uh, among young people has become somewhat stilted and interpersonal relations have suffered. And so uh, a lot of changes. And so back in 1991, we um, decided we'd try to do something about it uh, certainly not on a large scale, but we got a, I got up in front of our football team. I said, how many of you guys would be willing to serve as a mentor for 7th or 8th grade boys here in Lincoln Public Schools? I don't know why I picked 7th or 8th grade. It just seemed to be like a good number. And 22 hands went up, and so we mashed them up, and we uh, said, just spend some time with them every week. Once a month, we'd get them all together. We'd have a speaker, play some basketball have some pizza, and things seemed to be going pretty well. Then after a couple of years, I began to worry because some of these kids were now 15. And at that time, you could, uh, you could drop out of school at age 16. So I was kind of worried what was going to happen. And so at that point, I did something that was a little bit unexpected. I, I got them all together and got as many parents as I could uh, in the same room. And I lost my political career. And uh, you, know, you know what politicians often do, they make promises they can't keep. Well, that's what I did. I got in front of those kids and I said, now if you guys will stay out of trouble and graduate from high school, we'll pay your way to college. The only problem was we didn't have the money and we had no idea where the money was gonna come from. But it was the start of my political career. And uh, so after two or three years, we raised about $300,000 and that was the money. And so it kind of played itself out. These young people got to be seniors in high school and uh, were pleased with the results because of the 22, 21 graduated on time. And we thought if we got two thirds of them through, that'd be pretty good from that particular population. And of the 22, 18 went on to college. And that really surprised us because we thought maybe four or five would go on to college. And so we thought, well, maybe there's something to this. We really don't know much about it, but maybe it's something we can run with. So we expanded the program in Lincoln and began to use adults as mentors. We began to mentor young men and young women and um, started with about 250 in Lincoln and expanded. And today we're over 8,000 and 153 school districts all across Nebraska into Iowa. 14 chapters there, and we're into Wyoming just starting, and into Kansas. And so it's expanded pretty significantly. School-based mentoring, all the, all the mentoring occurs in the school building. And um, we do background checks, we train mentors, and, um, and so it's going pretty well. And I think it's important to, uh, if we're gonna talk to people about being mentors and say this seems to work, it's important to have some data and so uh, we've done research. Uh, you listened to Jim Clifton a little bit this morning. And of course, you know he's with Gallup. And so we went to Gallup. And they followed our matches for a period of five years. And subsequently, over the last 12 years, we've gathered our own data. But we find that in about 80 to 85% of our matches, that attendance at school improves. And so that sounds like a simple thing, a little thing. But the number one predictor of somebody dropping out of school is declining attendance. So when attendance improves and gets better, dropout rates go down, grades get better, and the percentage of kids going on to college improves. A young person with a mentor is 52% more likely to go on to post-secondary education than someone from similar circumstances who does not have a mentor. So it's important that there are some academic consequences but this is not a tutoring program, it's an interpersonal relationship. And so it's developmental, it's not tutoring. Second thing we found was kind of interesting, in about 80 to 85% of our matches, 
behavior improved. And uh, so that was significant. We found that uh, less classroom disruption, fewer trips to the principal's office, less substance abuse, uh, less teenage pregnancy, less gang membership, less criminal activity. And I guess most people would say, well, that's a good thing. And then the third thing we found was not necessarily anticipated, and that is that um, a young person with a mentor is much more hopeful, much more optimistic about the future. And I think we're all victims of our past experience. So if you grow up in a family where nobody's gone to college, you often don't expect to go to college. If you grow up in a family where maybe nobody's graduated from high school, your academic aspirations are often pretty low. If you grow up in a family where nobody's had a good job, you don't necessarily expect to get a good job either. But a mentor can show you the way through, how these things are possible. And so hope is really a big deal in, in addressing the human condition. Because um, if you have hope in your life, there's some light at the end of the tunnel. And if you don't have hope, you're going to fill your life with something. And generally speaking, it's all the wrong stuff. So those are some of the things we found. So you may say, well, OK, but this is a US-India summit. What does this have to do with India? And you folks probably, most of you, many of you know much more about the situation in India than I. And all I did is bunch a few keys on the internet. And I found that there are roughly 25 to 30 million kids that are called street kids in India. And that doesn't mean that these are the only kids that need mentors. There obviously are many more who are not on the streets. And of course, there's two groups there. There's kids on the street. These are kids who uh, work, uh, spend their time on the streets, and return to their homes at night and probably have some parental support. And then there are kids of the street. And these are young people who live on the street who don't have families, don't have any support at all. And so there's, it's a little fuzzy to pin down the numbers. But obviously, a lot of kids in India are living without much health care, without much education, without much emotional support from anyone. And so I would assume that some of the things I've just talked about, about some of the needs in the United States, definitely apply to India as well. And so anyway, that's, that's what we do. And um, first of all, I might just mention to you, and I'm talking about mentoring, where does that word come from? And some of you may remember from your literature classes that um, a fellow named Homer uh, lived several thousand years ago, was a Greek writer, and um, he wrote a book called The Odyssey. And um, the hero of this book was named Odysseus. And Odysseus was going to go off to fight in the Peloponnesian War. And he knew that he was going to be gone for several years. And so he had a son named Telemachus. And um, he was really concerned about who would care for Telemachus. Well, he was gone. And so he had a friend named Mentor. And this friend was given the charge of taking care of Telemachus, taking care of his education, his development as a young person, uh, making sure that he was cared for, instructed, and raised up to, to be a viable young man. So that's where the word mentor comes from. And so that's what a mentor is. It's a wise guide. It's a, an advocate, somebody who's on your side, somebody who wants you to be all that you can be. And so that's why we think mentoring is so important, because both in the United States and in India, there are people who can serve as mentors if they so choose. And uh, the trick is, of course, getting them to do that. And so a mentor really, in our experience, does basically three things. The first thing that a mentor does is love the mentee. I think sometimes uh, Hollywood has messed up our understanding of what love is. And there's a Greek word that I like to cite. It's called uh, agape. And the, the word uh, agape essentially means this. It means unconditional positive regard. 
means I will the best for you. So it can mean that that neighbor that lives next to you, who lets his leaves uh, blow on your yard, never shovels his sidewalks, never speaks, uh, you may not have a warm and fuzzy feeling for that person, but you can will the best for him. You can still not want uh, harm to come into his life. You can wish him the best. And essentially that's it, you know, because sometimes if you're mentoring a teenager, you don't always have a warm and fuzzy feeling, but you can will the best and want the best for that person. And so it demonstrates your love by, by showing up, by being consistent. And so we found that if a mentor shows up at least 24, 25 times in his school year of 35 weeks, that great things begin to happen. So consistency is really critical. The one thing that we don't want to have happen is there's somebody to say, well, I love you and I, I care about you, and they show up five times. That will do more harm than good. And so if you think about it, the most precious gift you can give another person. We often think in the United States that the most precious gift is something of monetary value. But you know, you can make more money, but none of us can make more time. The most precious gift that any of us can give another person is our time. So if you give somebody a slice of your life, you're giving them a great gift. And so if that mentor shows up every week, sometimes these young people who have had some negative things said about them, they have had negative thoughts about themselves, and they think, well, you know, if this person who has no obligation to do this cares about me enough to show up and spend time with me every week, maybe some of these things I've heard about myself and thought about myself aren't really true. Maybe I do have worth. And so it's a very powerful type of thing. And so I'll tell you a little story that uh, relates to this and um, probably relates to young people in both the United States and, and in India. We had a player on our football team back in the early 90s. His name was Lawrence Phillips. Probably doesn't even trigger a, mem a memory with most of you, but maybe some. And Lawrence was a, was a talented young guy. His uh, dad had left him as a baby. He'd been raised out in Los Angeles by his mom. And uh, mom had a boyfriend, and the boyfriend was abusive. And Lawrence uh, was kind of a hot reactor, and he took the boyfriend on at age 10. And I imagine it was a fairly physical confrontation. And the mother decided this wasn't going to work out very well, and she was going to have to make a choice. So she did, and she chose the boyfriend. So Lawrence at age 10 was out on the streets. And so he was essentially one of those street children that you've heard about. And he had no support. Didn't know where the next meal was coming from, didn't know where he was going to sleep that night, and just wandered to the streets. He ate out of garbage cans, slept under bridges, and he was on the street for two years, didn't go to school. And finally, somebody figured out this guy wasn't going to school. And so they put him in a group home. And this group home was a pretty tough place. This was for kids who were caught committing crimes. So all of them were criminals except Lawrence. And he was probably about the youngest kid there, and there was some abuse. Uh, it was a rough, tough deal. And so he managed to survive that, went into high school. And people found out he had some athletic ability and he could carry a football pretty well. So some college uh, coaches came around, looked at him, looked at his film and were impressed. And they looked at his transcript and a lot of them walked away because he hadn't been, been in school for those two years. He was very deficient in a lot of things. But we noticed that he had tested as being academically gifted. So we thought, well, maybe he has a little promise. We stayed with him a little longer. And finally, in his senior year of high school, he completed two years of schoolwork in one year. His junior and his senior year completed. He ended up with a pretty good ACT score because he was smart. Came to Nebraska, started for us as a freshman, played well, sophomore year, led, uh, was one of the leading rushers in the nation, led the conference, was uh, all-American teams. And in his third year, 
he was predicted to win the Heisman Trophy, which is the highest trophy you can have in college football. We had a good team to go with it, so he was probably going to do pretty well. In the first three games, he really rushed for two, three hundred yards a game and was doing well. And he had a girlfriend. The girlfriend drove him to the plane and went up to Michigan State to play. Said she'd be there and have a date with him when he got back. So he had a good day, game, came back, no girlfriend. So he went to bed and somebody called in the middle of the night and said, well, she's over at this other guy's place. And being a hot reactor like he was, he didn't just stay in bed. He went over there, climbed the stairs, opened the door, grabbed her by the sweatshirt, pulled her down three flights of stairs. And the news reports were that he'd beat her up. She said he didn't. The witnesses said he didn't. The police report said he didn't. But he did pull her down three flights of stairs. So I kicked him off. Kicked him off for six weeks. I knew the only organizing thing in his life was football. That was the only thing I could think of that would keep him on track. And so I said, okay, Lawrence, six weeks, no, no practice, no weight room, no training table. Don't miss a class. Don't miss a single counseling center. We're going to do a psychological workup on you. And you do everything you're supposed to do. And if you do, then we'll sit down and we'll talk. If you don't, you're gone. So he did everything he was supposed to do. And so we brought him back. Then start the next two games. Man, he was out of shape. And then finally we had a bowl game. We had some time off and he got back in shape. And we played and we won the bowl game by 40 points. And so the press said, well, the only reason you brought him back was so that you could win. We had another back named Amon Green, who's the all-time leading rusher for the Green Bay Packers. And we didn't need Lawrence. But we thought Lawrence needed the football team. So he decided to go into the NFL. And some of those anger issues and some of the things that had happened to him in the past continued to haunt him, and he ended up throwing, being thrown in prison. And Lawrence really hated gang members. I don't know why. Probably had had some experience with gang members. And uh, he didn't want anything to do with them. And he let the, the authorities in the prison know that, that he absolutely didn't want a cellmate who was a gang member. So I put a guy in there that was a gang member, big guy, bigger than Lawrence, had 13 felonies. Three of them were murders. And so you might predict things weren't going to go well. And there was a fight. And the other guy died. So now Lawrence is charged with murder. And so about a year and a half ago, we get word that Lawrence had taken his life. And so uh, he kind of got to the point where he figured he was never going to get out. And so the reason I mention this story to you is that I think, I don't know this for sure, but I think that if he'd had somebody in his life when he was 9 or 10 or 11 who uh, loved him, who cared about him unconditionally, uh, who was on his side, that uh, things probably wouldn't have gotten to that point. And so sometimes these cases are a matter of life or death. Most of the time they're not. But quite often they're really critical. And so the mentor loves the mentee. You're all adults, I think. Most everybody in here is an adult. And uh, you know how life is if you go... <laughs> a uh, couple weeks, a couple months, and nobody says, uh, thanks for doing this. I see that you have this talent. Uh, I, I really believe in you. Uh, life gets hard in your job, in your family, whatever. And lots of kids, for whatever reason, sometimes go pretty long periods of time without anybody saying a kind word, without providing some kind of affirmation. So um, we use Gallup, Strength Finders, and you're probably somewhat familiar. And you realize that everybody has some strengths. Everybody has some things they do better than most other people. So we use that with these kids. And, and so it's kind of energizing for them to realize that there are some things that they do better than most other people. And so when we see those strengths in play, we affirm them. We make a big deal out of them. So for example, one of the young guys that I'm mentoring right now, one of his, his main strengths is that uh, he's an includer. And so he doesn't like to see somebody being bullied, doesn't like to see somebody sitting by themselves in the lunchroom. And, 
And so uh, if I see that in play, I'll make a big deal out of it. And so I'll say, you know, this isn't just about you sitting by Johnny at lunch on Monday. Uh, that was nice. But this is who you are. And this is going to serve you well throughout your lifetime. This is going to be attractive to employees. It's going to be attractive to people who know you. And so we identify strengths and we affirm them and we make a big deal out of them. And those strengths lead often to academic majors. They often lead to occupations. And as Jim Clifton would tell you, there's some people who have jobs who they don't, that they don't really see as work. There's something that really is a major passion of theirs. And when you connect strengths with occupation, then sometimes you have a really dynamic situation. And so that's what we try to do, and we try to steer them into college courses and, and so on. And then the last thing I'll mention to you is this. Um, I think one of the things about mentoring that's very powerful is to provide a, a vision of what's possible. If you think about when you were young, uh, a lot of times, at least I can think about when I was young, I didn't think very far down the road. Sometimes about as far as I could think was the next football game or the next basketball game or maybe the next vacation or the next test or maybe the next date or whatever. And that's the way most kids are. And, uh, but a mentor can see a little further down the road. And so I'll tell you a story about uh, my grandfather. And um, so this is really an old story because you see how old I am. And uh, my grandfather and his family went west to western Nebraska back in the 1870s from Illinois to Homestead. I don't know if you know anything about the Homestead Act. Passed in about 1860 and what that meant was if you lived on a piece of ground for a year, you owned the ground. Didn't have to pay for it. So they went out to western Nebraska in pretty dry climate, pretty sandy soil. The piece they got didn't get a very good piece of land. Four kids in the family. And uh, my grandfather's father, my great-grandfather, was a Civil War veteran. That gives you an idea how old I am. And, um, and he's also an alcoholic. So the future for my grandfather didn't look very bright. But one day he was asked to give a speech about the fifth grade. Might have been at a school event, church event, I'm not sure which. And in attendance that day, there happened to be a circuit rider. A guy who rode from one town to the other out in eastern Wyoming, western Nebraska, a little bit of South Dakota, and was a preacher. And he would go to various uh, churches and established churches. And so he got my grandfather's side after my grandfather's talk, and he pointed out a strength. He said, you know, that was a real good speech. You have unusual speaking ability. And then he began to paint the picture. He said, you know, I don't know if you thought about this or not, but I think someday you could be a great preacher. Or if my grandfather never thought about being a preacher, never entered his head. But every time the guy rode the circuit about once a month, he'd look my grandfather up, spend some time with him, paint the picture. So my grandfather graduated from seventh grade. And in the 1870s, that was about as far as you went. That was all, that was all the grades they had there in that little town. And this guy said, no, that's not going to be enough. If you want to be a preacher, you're going to have to go to high school. Well, the only problem was the nearest high school was 100 miles away. So because of his, this mentor that he had, my grandfather got in a stagecoach, went up to Crawford, Nebraska, 100 miles away, got a job in a grocery store, worked his way through, and now this guy put Crawford on his itinerary. He stopped seeing my grandfather. About once a month, he'd paint that picture. So my, gradu my grandfather graduated from high school, and this guy said, well, now that's wonderful. But that's not going to be enough. Now you're going to have to go to college. Well, in that particular era, only 2% of the population in the United States went to college. And from western Nebraska, nobody went to college. And so my grandfather, because of this guy's encouragement, went up to Alliance, got on a train, went down to Hastings, Nebraska, enrolled in college, and uh, played football there. And uh, in those days, pretty rough game. No helmets, just screw your hair out a little bit longer. He was a captain of his team and was a good player. He spoke five languages because he'd worked at a trading post and was fluent in five languages. And a pretty good student, graduated.
from college and did become a preacher, pretty well known, and um, served a lot of churches out in western Nebraska, served two terms in the state legislature, and he lived a good life, and he lived a life that was very different than what he would have lived if he hadn't had that mentor in his life. And so you may say, well, why are you going that far back in history? There's certainly a lot of current stories that would be equally dramatic, and there are. But the reason I do this is that so often people think, well, there's a lot of kids out there that could use a mentor. And uh, if I mentor one kid, what difference does that make? Uh, if, if I mentor one young person in India or the United States, uh, what difference does that make in the great picture? Well, the reason it makes a difference is that there's a ripple effect. Because you see, my grandfather had five children, and all five of those kids were expected to go to college, and they did during the Great Depression, when not very many people went to college. And they were all expected to live a certain kind of life, a life of service, because of his contact with that mentor, and they did. And it impacted my life because I was a grandchild. My grandfather was killed by lightning when I was nine. It was during World War II. My dad was gone for five years. My mom was working in an ammunition plant, and I wasn't the best kid. I always figured my grandfather, being a man of the cloth, had gone to heaven and probably could see what I was doing. And so that kind of kept me straight. So he had a very powerful influence on me and on my children, my grandchildren. And I would guess probably on the 2,000 odd young people that I coached over 36 years. And so the reason I mention this is there will be a ripple effect that will go down through several generations. And if you're concerned about the culture, which I am, uh, the best way that I know to change a culture is not through a federal program or some massive sweeping change of some kind. It's usually one person at a time. And if you mentor the right person, you will have a very powerful effect uh, on their family, people they work with. And if it's the right person, it could be hundreds or even thousands of other people. So that's why we do what we do. And that, that's why we think it's important. And the interesting thing is that we're not just changing the lives for the better of 8,000 kids. We're really changing the lives of 16,000 people because there's a pretty powerful effect on the mentor as well. If you think about it, uh, again, to refer to Gallup, um, there was a research study done a few years ago. They surveyed th thousands of, of US citizens and they asked them if they were happy. And most Americans said, well, yeah, happy was sort of defined in this survey of, of having your needs met. And most people said, yeah, we, we have enough discretionary wealth, we have enough food, we have, a, we have shelter, we have clothing, we have transportation, so yeah, we're, we're happy. Uh, not all, but most everybody said that. And then they said this. They said, does your life have meaning or does it have purpose? And the answer there was not so much. An awful lot of people don't have meaning or purpose in their life. Because you see, meaning and purpose comes from serving and from giving and sometimes sacrificing. And that's where purpose and meaning comes from. And so most of our mentors will tell you that they think they get as much or more out of being a mentor than their mentees. And sometimes they don't articulate it very well, but I think what they're expressing really is the fact that it adds a dimension of purpose and meaning to their life that they do not find in any other way. When you do something for somebody who can't do anything for you on the surface in return, it's very powerful. So enough from me. Uh, Deepak is a mentor, and uh, we appreciate that very much. And thank you for listening, and uh, hope you have a, a good day the rest of the day. Thanks for having me.